And she's thought a lot about it really in two dimensions. One is, of course, the learner experience, and she's developed a growing national reputation as a person expert in thinking about how trainees learn about primary care. For example, sitting on um, doing work related to the AAIM primary care toolkit and the delivery of excellent education to trainees. Also in terms of healthcare disparities and social determinants of health. And there sits on the AAIM disparities collaborative. She also thinks a lot about women, women in medicine, how we care for women patients in our communities and how we create an environment where we're fully inclusive of diversity and all that that implies for our patients and for ourselves. Tamara is a, is a wonderful person. It's really a delight for me to have her on our faculty and I'm thrilled to have her here today to talk about more how we think about training primary care uh, trainees for the next generation and the next challenges that lay before us. Tamara, welcome. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm looking at all the, the names on the screens and it's really a pleasure, even though it's virtual, to see so many familiar um, names and some faces. So thank you for having me. You know, as I was thinking about this talk, anybody who's done any virtual lecturing or talking, it's a very strange experience because you do not have the in-person feedback of folks. Um, and I, I came across this diagram. Um, let me just, sorry. <clears throat> I just need to give us one moment. Perfect. Um, I came across this diagram, which of course the outside of which many of you will recognize. And it made me think about where is my head at with all this virtual learning stuff. And I think I'm somewhere between a four and a five uh, currently as an educator, as a parent, I'm a hard two. But as an educator, I'm somewhere between a four and a five. And I hope for today, you will join me in accepting this is where we are at and we can make the most of the next um, 45 minutes or so together. And I see many people have their videos off and I, I totally get it because if you're anything like me, this is my, my new reality. Uh, so feel free to keep your videos off and um, I look forward to, to having you join us today. I have no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, so today what I'd like to do is to first review the primary care landscape as it relates to residency training discuss evidence supporting a shift in how we're training residents in primary care, and then describe some initiatives within our own track here at Mount Sinai Morningside West and their potential application to other GME specialties. And I really wanna emphasize this is a primary care talk, but much of what I'm going to be talking about today is certainly applicable to other specialties. So those of you who are educators, um, subspecialty educators, I really hope that this will provide some meaning to you as you design your curriculum going forward. So we're gonna get started. So we know the more primary care physicians we have, the better the health outcomes of our patients and the lower the costs. And some of you may have seen this, this is this year's AAMC data on primary care physician shortages. And you can see that by 2033, there is an anticipated range of PCP shortages, anywhere from 21,000 to 55,000. And these, this range is calculated based on both supply and demand factors. So the main driver of demand is of course our aging population. And the number, uh, the percent increase in patients over the age of 65 in the next 15 years is 45%. So that is certainly a main driver of demand. And that aging population also affects our supply. So primary care physicians will too be aging and be older than 65, and many of them will be retiring. And so that's a huge driver. Of course, there are many factors, the pipeline issues, we don't yet know how COVID is going to affect both pipeline issues and people dropping out of primary care. Certainly it has taken a financial um, hit as a result of COVID, but things can change um, quite dramatically. This is a graph showing primary care physicians by year of residency from 1980 to 2015. So this includes family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics. Um, you can see there was a little blip in the late 90s 
uh, with the rise of managed care in the 80s, there was a push for my, more primary care physicians in the 90s. And the numbers of residents entering internal medicine has continued to increase, but of course, the majority of residents are going into specialty. And so it's about 70-30 at this point. Um, and that too has been a driver in terms of the primary care pipeline. In 1970, the first primary care program through internal medicine emerged at Brigham and Women, and this was, of course, in an effort to increase primary care physicians. And you can see I've listed the last five years of data from the NRMP match. Um, there are over 100 programs, primary care programs in this country, with a separate NRMP match um, from their categorical program. And you can see the number of matriculants has continued to increase. Um, almost every spot is filled in the match. And so there, there is a promising trend of increased interest in these, in these programs. And I should mention they vary widely. Some of you may have colleagues or know people in primary care programs across the country. They vary in terms of, of the number of residents, the amount of time residents spend in the outpatient setting. Many have a secondary continuity site. Uh, so there's great variety. And Paul O'Rourke at a Bayview um, conducted an, a survey of, of primary care internal medicine program directors uh, a couple years ago. And some of the findings um, that emerged was that about 90% of programs have, their residents are based for their primary practice site in either an academic uh, center or a hospital. 10%, such as our program, have their residents actually based in the community. And this will hopefully um, be of more importance as we move forward through the presentation. And this is just looking at recruitment methods. So again, about 58% of, of programs have a separate NRMP match. And about 42% do not. And so some programs, residents opt in once they are selected into the categorical program. So the big question is, do these tracks work? And I think it really depends on whether you see the glass is half full or half empty. This was a study in 2012 that surveyed, the authors surveyed PGY1s, this was from an ITE survey. So they surveyed PGY1s and said, how many of you are interested, what is the likelihood, or how many of you are interested in going into primary care? And about 15% said yes. And then they looked at that same cohort as PGY3s. And the number going into primary care was or with an intention to practice primary care was about half of that. So something is happening during residency training that impacts that decision. It's not like res uh, resident medical students come in, they're predestined to do primary care and it's easy, they, they end up doing primary care. Something is impacting that decision. In Paula Work's survey, he found that on average, 57% of graduates from, prim pr from primary care programs in 2016 and 17 pursued primary care. So you might look at this and say, that's fantastic, as the authors did, that's tr triple the rate of residents in a categorical program. On the other hand, presumptively residents entering a primary care program have an interest in primary care. So somewhere along the lines, 40 some odd percent are not pursuing primary care. Other findings from this survey were that NRMP programs tended to be more successful in retaining residents in primary care. And interestingly, the only variable associated or factor associated with fewer residents in a program pursuing primary care was having an X plus Y schedule, which really runs counter to previous evidence. Um, generally, residents, program directors speak very positively about X plus Y schedules, which is dividing inpatient responsibilities and outpatient responsibilities. And I remember when I trained, uh, once a week, every Thursday afternoon, I had my continuity clinic, whether I was in the ICU, whether I was on a very busy, demanding inpatient rotation, that's how it was. And, and now, of course, things have changed. So it's hypothesis generating. Of course, there's great variety in how X plus Y schedules are structured. And interestingly, they found that number of continuity clinics, whether you had a secondary site, lower no-show rates, better support in the clinic, did not significantly impact career decision. And this to me is, is a big finding because many primary, it's a very resource intensive process to find a secondary site for residents um, to rotate through. And so perhaps 
um, we're not directing our attention where it needs to be in terms of trying to get residents into primary care. So Theodore Long out of Yale did a, I think it was three institutions, three primary care programs. Um, he did a qualitative interview type study and he asked these residents, what are some of the factors that impact your decision to pursue primary care? And on the left are the negative factors. And some common themes were being overwhelmed by social needs, feeling ill prepared to handle the social needs, having mentorship outside of primary care, concern about burnout, and then negative perceptions from the institution. On the right, the positive factors to me weren't so surprising, right? Having positive mentorship, having a supportive peer group, uh, exposing residents to a variety of outpatient practices, increased time, and improved clinic functioning. And I wanna just take one moment to talk about institutional culture because this is something that's very difficult to measure and yet hugely impactful on a trainee's decision to pursue primary care. And I have heard numerous, numerous stories from trainees about their experience with this. Certainly, I remember uh, as a chief being told numerous times, well, what specialty are you going into? What specialty are you going into? And there really was a push away from primary care, um, when in fact, that was what really appealed to me. And so I think all of us have a part to play in this. Um, if you are a specialist and you see qualities in a resident that may trigger, oh, she should be a great primary care physician. He'd be great. Oh, he, he's really an effective team leader. Um, wow, she identified the social barrier that completely transformed uh, our care of this patient. Think about encouraging them to go into primary care and certainly help connect them to primary care mentors. Okay, so let's look at where primary care programs are located. So the red dots represent primary care programs and you can see that over 40% are located in the Northeast. And I want you to look at this map, which is a map of medically underserved areas defined by HRSA. Um, so either that's a low primary care physician to population ratio um, a shortage of primary care physicians for particular populations, so uh, those living below the federal poverty level, and those greater than 65. And you can see the yellow areas represent medically underserved areas, the sort of light blue medically underserved populations. And when you compare these two maps, you see that the majority of primary care programs are located precisely in the area with the least need. And there's a mismatch between where primary care residents are training and where they're needed most. And over 50% of residents tend to practice in, within 100 miles of where they train. So uh, this is a problem and potentially an area where we certainly need to focus our attention in our physician workforce. And we know there's a gap in residents pursuing rural primary care. Um, but I have become increasingly interested in our residents choosing to work in non-rural medically underserved areas in our in some of our urban underserved areas for example there was a meta-analysis done by folks out in california and to be honest there's not much evidence about about this um, but they looked i think they had a total of, of 70 studies of varying quality and they divided the factors into three buckets and the first are personal attributes Self-identified underrepresented in medicine physicians are almost three times as likely to practice in medically underserved areas as their counterparts. And if they have a language concordance with the underserved population, they're more likely to practice there. Uh, residents who have a prior interest in underserved practice, and that is that precedes medical school. If you grew up in a rural background, you're more likely to practice in a rural setting. And then international medical graduate status as well. In terms of financial factors that impact how likely you are to practice in an underserved areas, having a low debt burden. So those with no debt, much more likely, almost three times more likely to practice in an underserved area than those who have a large debt burden. And the National Health Service Corps scholarship recipients. So for those who are unfamiliar, the National Health Service Corps um, provides scholarship for medical education in return for two years of service in an underserved area. And physicians who receive this scholarship are more likely to be retained in those areas. And finally, and sort of the, the area where I think you can make the most difference um, is curriculum. So some medical schools have very targeted tracks um, to expose students to these underserved areas. That seems to play a role. 
and then exposure to community-based centers and residency. And you're probably seeing a theme here. Oh, so I was listening to a podcast last week um, and he was talking about how we process in virtual platforms. And the host suggested that our attention span on a virtual platform is about 10 minutes. And so that we need to take pauses every 10 minutes to sort of reset our own attention spans. And so I thought I would pause on this picture. This is one of um, my favorite places in the world, um, the Milford Sound in New Zealand. So we'll take a brief pause. Okay. I'll see if it works. I don't know. Give it a try today. Um, so are internal medicine residents prepared to address the needs of the underserved? And I will say that oftentimes um, residents think they're more prepared than they are. So the first data that I want to approach is the CLEAR program. For those of you who are not familiar, this is the Clinical Learning Environment Review. It's part of the Next Accreditation System 3 CGME. And it was started many, uh, not many years ago, what, five to 10 years ago, in order to give clinical learning environments feedback um, about how they do in terms of quality improvement, professionalism, um, and health disparities is something that they touch on as well. And in their first national report, they found that only 33% of residents and fellows reported receiving culturally competent training for the specific populations at risk for health disparities at their site. Given that residents and fellows are the majority of frontline providers with underserved populations, yet don't seem to really understand the own, their own populations, this really sets us up to fail in terms of health outcomes. In a single institution study of primary care residents, these were family medicine, internal medicine, only 14% of residents felt comfortable discussing social determinants of health with patients and only 10% felt competent addressing them. And in a survey of internal medicine program directors, only 40% reported having any kind of health disparities curriculum in any formal manner um, in 2015, despite more than 70% of them having had a clear visit with feedback. So a few years ago, um, Dr. Deepal Patel and myself were interested in what our residents know or their attitudes towards social determinants of health. And we conducted a survey of our residents um, and I might say have a, had a great response rate. You don't often see this with resident surveys, but 76% response rate. 37% felt it was very important to care for an underserved population, but only 7% reported preparedness to address the social needs of the population. So we've identified a huge gap in our training. So part of the work I'm doing currently involves qualitative um, qualitative educational research. And last year, um, Dr. David Thomas and I conducted focus groups with internal medicine residents at Sinai Main Hospital at Beth Israel. We conducted focus groups with their outpatient faculty preceptors, as well as the program directors, to understand what exactly residents learn during their outpatient rotation. And I'm going to put up here a quote from one of the residents that reflected a very common theme and to which many of the residents on the call today I'm sure can relate. I think a lot of our patients bring a lot of like not strictly medical issues to the visit and we're not trained to really help or support them with those things and sometimes the visits are dominated by those issues and I don't feel like I'm well trained to help them other than like listening like a normal community person would do that. So we have a gap um, and I wanted to highlight two types of programs within internal medicine that I think provide a nice stage from which to inform future primary care tracks. And the first model is, uh, are called urban health tracks. I don't know how many of you are familiar with these. They have certainly increased in number in the last 10 years, but they were started at Johns Hopkins about 10 years ago in an effort to engage residents in the East Baltimore community. And the hallmark of this track, at, specifically at Hopkins, was that residents spend 28 weeks outside of their primary care practice, outside of the hospital, and immersed in the community. So they are in substance use uh, clinics, they are in uh, correctional facilities, mental health clinics. 
And they looked at their results a few years later. And 2017, they had a total of 16 graduates from the program. 56% went into primary care, 31% specialty training, and many of these residents went on to become community-based leaders. And, you know, 56%, again, is about average for a primary care program, but at Johns Hopkins, I think the categorical rate was like 1%. Um, so this program seemed to have make, made a big difference. And 95% of the graduates stated that the urban health track was a major factor in their decision. Another model, which um, some of you may be familiar with, are teaching health center GME programs. They started around the same time, and through the Affordable Care Act, HRSA gave money to community-based centers to train residents in primary care. So it was a new way of funding residents. And the same thing, these programs focus on a really robust community-based exposure because they are in community-based centers. This includes the majority of family medicine programs, um, and then there are internal medicine programs. And this year, there are 770 residents across 60 primary care programs in something like 25 states. Uh, NYU is, is one of those programs. Um, and 55% of residents in these programs indicate a desire to practice in underserved areas. So whether that, that intention translates to practice um, is not entirely clear, but presumptively um, many will. And 69% intend to practice in primary care. So I wanna just put this together. And on the left in the pink are factors impacting a career choice in an underserved area. And on the right are factors impacting a career choice in primary care. So my own thinking was, if we can identify the factors that drive both of these and focus on that, that perhaps that will set the stage for success in meeting the, the workforce demands. And in fact, there are three factors that do connect both of these. One is competence in caring for the underserved. Of course, mentorship and exposure to community-based practices. Before I go forward, I wanna comment on two educational models that help support the idea of competence in caring for disadvantaged populations. And these were two articles two, uh, that really sort of propelled me to incorporate this into our primary care track. And the first was uh, by Jenny Siegel out at BU. And she uh, had an invited commentary in academic medicine a few, two years ago integrating social determinants of health into graduate medical education. And this really was a manifesto of sorts um, in which the authors encourage not only universalization of social determinants of health training in residency, but making sure this is seamless. So incorporated into morning reports, incorporated into the clinical setting. And finally, incorporating these as core competencies in training. Uh, it's a really wonderful piece for anybody who has an interest in this, a very compelling piece, I think, for our educational community. And the second uh, study that has been quite impactful was published in 2014 by Jonathan Metzel and Helena Hansen on structural competency. And this is a term they use um, to target all medical trainees. The idea that residents not only should they become competent in cultural competency, recognizing how the patient in front of me, um, the, the diversity of the patients we see and having more of a cultural understanding of the patient in front of me, but thinking about how structures shape the health of our patients. And I put the article up here for those of you who are interested, um, but it, it's quite compelling that we really need to move away from just a single model of me in front of the patient in the exam room to thinking about more broadly what patients are bringing with them to the exam room when we see that. So are we even required to teach this? What does the ACGME say? Well, in fact, yes. And in 2018, in their common program requirements, programs must understand the social determinants of health of the populations they serve and incorporate them in the design and implementation of the program curriculum with the ultimate goal of addressing these needs and health disparities. And this impacts all residencies and all fellowships. So if you are involved in subspecialty educa uh, fellowship education, this is something that um, certainly you need to be cognizant of about, about for your own trainees. And this is just an accompanying article, I think a year later, that shows the specific uh, focuses of uh, related to social determinants in the core program requirements. 
And of course, without clarifying the relevance of this for trainees, we will fail. And that's sort of a tenet of adult learning theory that trainees, learners need to understand the relevance of what we're teaching them. And this is um, a diagram I showed. I recently gave a talk to the interns, so this will look familiar to those of you who uh, we got to meet last week. But this is from the County Health Rankings, um, which is an independent organization that assesses the health of communities based on a variety of factors. And what you see here, and what I think is striking, is that the clinical care we provide is responsible for a very small fraction of preventable health outcomes. It is the other factors, the social and economic factors, the physical environment, and the health behaviors which are impacted by those factors that are really determining the health of our patients. And this is not to say what we're doing in the exam room is not important, of course, but it's to say we need to be more cognizant of upstream factors if we truly want to impact the health of our patients. And nowhere is this more evident than in our own backyard. I am always struck by this, um, these numbers here. In the borough of Manhattan, there's a 10-year life expectancy difference. If you live in the financial district or if you live in central Harlem, and this begs the question, why? What is driving this? And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has only, I think the one silver lining of all this is it has helped to expose the structural inequities that contribute to health disparities among our populations. These are just some titles from both the popular press and medical literature to hone in on the point that it matters. And I will say, having conducted talks over the last three years on social determinants with all of our categorical residents, this year, I was particularly struck by our intern class, how sophisticated their understanding of this was. And I wonder to what extent it is because of the current um, climate in which we are, are living. And we'll take our second cognitive pause. This probably looks, hopefully looks familiar to some of you. This is another special place to me. Um, this is in Paris, France, just a side street. So let's put this all together. One of the main drivers of why residents don't pursue primary care in underserved areas is that they feel, feel ill-prepared to care for the needs of complex patients, uh, socially complex patients. So if we provide community-based training, if we develop competence, so that means introducing formal curriculum of social determinants, structural determinants of population health, and of course provide mentorship, then likely we are setting the stage for success. And this was much of my thinking um, as the primary care track has evolved. And a little bit about our track. So it started in, you probably recognize some of these faces, it started in 2017. We had residents opt in who were already in the categorical program. And since that time, we have expanded and expanded and expanded even further. And the cornerstone of the track as a PGY-1 is that we want each of our PGY-1 residents to spend an entire two-week block focused on the community in which their primary practice site is located in central Harlem. And this rotation is focused on health equity, population health, understanding the physical environment and how that shapes health. And I'm going to talk about some of the activities in a moment um, that I hope will spark perhaps some, some ideas you have and please share them with me. On the top is our no longer PGY1s, PGY2s. Um, as PGY1s, they did a service learning activity at the Iris House. They were working in a soup kitchen. Thank you to Dr. Mack for helping to foster that connection. Um, in the lower right, Inez and Raul, um, we did a neighborhood asset mapping activity. So they get a case about a patient that they would see in clinic. And this case was about food insecurity. And so they were walking around the neighborhood to get a sense of what is the price of vegetables at a bodega, at a fruit cart, at the grocery store. When we tell our patients, go, go eat healthy, go exercise, what does that actually mean for our patients uh, who are on SNAP benefits, for example? And then in the lower left this year, uh, two of our interns, Dr. Dunker, Dr. Socorro, uh, gave a health talk to residents at Iris House about COVID and self-care. 
And I will say it takes a village and there are so many um, individuals to thank for making this happen. Um, those of you in education know having carved out time like this is really a rarity. And thank you to Dr. Seward in the department and to the um, internal medicine program for their support. Um, we had grant opportunities that allowed us to protect time uh, for faculty to be involved with this. Um, and I was fortunate to have colleagues who had interest in this topic. And of course, we had to engage the clinic leadership um, who was very supportive and being an FQHC, their goal really to care for a community, um, I think really helped um, give a lot of momentum to the project. And finally, I wanna comment, those of you who are interested in starting curriculum, always think about what other activities are going on within the region um, or locally. We were really fortunate that at that time, the Greater New York Hospital Association um, got us involved early on creating a guide on training residents in social determinants of health, as well as um, they selected our primary care track as one of 10 programs in the state who would partner with community-based organizations. And so we were fortunate to be able to partner with City Health Works. Our residents spent time with community coaches, uh, seeing what they do when we, when we refer a patient to their services. It, it was really great. Um, again, I want to thank Dr. Deepal Patel. She was a co-curriculum developer in this process. And we started in 2018 with a whiteboard. And I remember just saying, let's think big. What is our wish list? For residents. And um, in 2018, in September, we finally rolled out our first rotation. We have had three uh, each year. The interns rotate through the block. We make tweaks, we modify based on resident feedback and uh, needs. We divided our curriculum into four topics, which obviously overlap with one another, but population health, caring for at-risk patients, health systems and policy, and professional development. And I'll talk briefly about some of the activities that I think may be of more interest to folks. In population health, um, I mentioned the neighborhood asset mapping, a really wonderful idea to get people on the streets where you're practicing. Most of our residents go from their apartment to their Ryan Clinic and back again. And I think that that sort of defeats the purpose of being in a community-based um, setting. We met with Department of Health officials to understand how to go about looking at data on local health disparities. And if you haven't visited the New York City Department of Health site, which I'm sure many of you have in the COVID pandemic, they have street level data on health outcomes. It's really fascinating. We're one of the few places that, that have access to this information. So um, it's really worth taking a look. Um, in terms of caring for at-risk patients, we've had faculty, many of whom are on the call today, uh, who have given talks on incarceration health, homelessness, addiction medicine. We've been able to foster clinical community partnerships, um, again, with City Health Works, with Iris House. And we've had an opportunity to meet with public housing leaders. Ryan Adair, where the residence clinic is located, um, has a public housing building about a block away, two blocks away, in which many of our patients um, come from. And we got to meet with the Tenants Association, the leader of the Tenants Association, to understand what are, what are the concerns of, of tenants, of residents there. Health policy and systems, um, every year we have leadership come talk to the residents. Dr. Seward comes every year. Um, Art Gianelli makes it a priority to speak to the residents every year about the future of primary care and health policy. They are introduced to what a federally quali qualified health center means. So for the residents on the call today, ask yourself, do you know what it means to be a federally qualified health center? Um, they get talks on value-based payment models, cost-effective prescribing, and even um, a few years ago, we got to spend time looking at emerging primary care practices that were actually direct primary care practices working with underserved populations. Yeah, sorry, I joined a couple minutes. Yeah. Oh, no, wait. Um, Anna, okay. sorry. I Okay, um, and in terms of professional development, this is probably arguably the most important part of this is how do we sustain what they're learning? Uh, they are involved in community-based health talks, and I know residents always come up to me, not just in the primary care track, but can we do something for our patients? Can we lead talks for our patients? The answer is yes, and, and start doing it, start practicing. They engage in workshops in terms of patient-centered communication skills, cultural humility, motivational interviewing, and this year was really exciting. We got to roll out the first um, curriculum at the Sim Lab. So thank you to Dr. Matthew, Dr. Kurtz. I had a ton of fun. We were 
focused on addressing social determinants of health in the clinical encounter. So residents were presented with a patient that they would see in the outpatient setting with an acute exacerbation of a chronic disease, and they had to not only identify, but mitigate that barrier within the course of a visit. And finally are the scholarly projects. Each of our residents is required to complete a scholarly project with one-to-one -one faculty mentorship. And our residents have presented at, at the National SGIM Conference every year. It's been a really exciting um, part of this, of this track. This is us a few weeks ago. Thank you to Dr. Chibis, um, who was my co-facilitator for the Sim Lab. And this is just to give you a sample of what we were assessing our residents on. They needed to be able to screen, document, communicate effectively, assess disease control, utilize resources within the clinic, be able to write a, a social prescription for a patient, and then develop a plan and effectively communicate at the closure of the visit. And I'm gonna list up here the, the scholarly projects our residents have been involved with. Take a look at this list um, and see there may be projects you are particularly interested in learning more about, and I'm happy to talk offline about it. Most of them take the form of quality improvement, um, curriculum development, research, and this year I'm really excited the interns are doing a project on asthma and ED utilization. The rates of asthma, of ED utilization for asthma in central Harlem are almost 2.5 times that uh, in the rest of the city. And we're not only going to be focused on QI, but looking at how we can serve as advocates to address more of the structural uh, barriers to care. And you can see they've really done a wonderful job on each of these topics. I want to thank Dr. Patel and Dr. Mack, who have served as um, faculty mentors for these projects and really helped to propel them forward. This is just a sample of our schedule. Um, this year, obviously, with COVID, we had to make a lot of last minute changes, uh, but generally we tried to create themes for the day so that there is some connection between what they're learning and then what they're doing. And I will make these slides accessible, but just for the educators in the room, I think it's important to know uh, sort of the efforts and resources that are required for activities. And so I tried to create a chart here that shows you the resource need um, in terms of faculty, time required, or stakeholder buy-in for each of these activities. So if you have a little time in your curriculum and you want to do something low, low, uh, low effort, you know, here's an option, but just to give you some of uh, an arsenal of potential options. This will be our final pause of the presentation. Thank you for sticking with me. Okay. So how do we do? So we had a total of 12 residents, four residents per year, complete the rotation. And I've placed up here um, just three sample questions from our survey. We had 10, 10 point scales and we uh, had about 25 questions in the survey to assess knowledge and attitude. And I think most importantly, how prepared do you feel to address the social needs of underserved patients? Um, there was an increase and a statistically significant increase. How knowledgeable are you about the demographics of patients at your site? Um, and again, a statistically significant increase. And then just a sample of sort of the confidence or, or um, confidence level to be able to enact some of the things they learned. How comfortable are you providing cost-saving alternatives to uninsured patients? And that was statistically significant. And in fact, the two questions that weren't st statistically significant were interest in primary care and interest in working with the underserved, both of which were very high to start and increased as well, but um, not to a degree that was statistically significant. So we were very pleased. In doing a SWOT analysis of this project, um, I think the strengths were definitely the individual mentorship, having protected time, of course, and really the small size of the learner group. Um, and I think that facilitates um, not only faculty to resident support, but peer-to-peer -peer support. Weaknesses, there's never enough time. So that's an easy one. I think all of us want to have our residents doing more of what we're doing more of the time. Um, but I really do think the political and pandemic climate has provided an opportunity where this has become on the uh, sort of on the radar of most organizations now. And so to me, that's something that can help propel this work. Um, 
systems work groups. You know, two of our residents presented to the Mount Sinai SDH steering committee last week. They presented their projects and surprisingly, we're actually able to garner resources and support for the projects. So it's really um, important to look within the system at other um, activities that may be overlapping with yours. And then, of course, the community focus of the federally qualified health center is a huge advantage for our program. And I think the only threats were really that this is an isolated block of time. How do we sustain the work they're doing throughout the curriculum? This is to show our primary care track recruitment. So in 2017, I mentioned we started with five and we've really almost tripled in size over the last three years with successful separate NRMP matches over the last three years when we started. And since 2017, we've had five graduates, 80% have pursued primary care, 60% have pursued primary care um, and with an underserved population. We have three graduates this year, two going into clinician education, one going into geriatrics. And I wanted to just highlight some familiar faces who have been through this track in some way. Dr. Edelman is one of our assistant program directors for the internal medicine program. Dr. Olu Shoga is a, at the faculty practice on 147th Street, as well as a clinician educator uh, for our residents. And I am happy to announce Dr. Heather Viola is, going, is our current assistant program director for the track. She is a clinician educator at Ryan and is at the faculty practice at Monsonia. So in summary, we are facing a primary care shortage, particularly in medically underserved areas. To practice primary care in underserved areas will require residents to be comfortable identifying and addressing the structural and social determinants of health. I think we need to shift our focus in GME toward increasing trainee exposure and skills to address these barriers. And initiatives within our own primary care track have shown promising success and can be considered applicable to other GME programs. And with that, I want to send a special thanks to the folks I've listed here, um, as well as, of course, to the residents who absolutely make it a joy to mentor um, every day. And please, if you are eligible, remember to vote. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, and with that, David, do you want to just help? And I will um, certainly answer questions that um, you may I, have. I'm here, I have the chat open. Okay. So if anyone has any questions, you feel free to unmute yourself or just type them in the chat. Hey, Tanner, it's uh, John Andrilli. Hi, John. I just want to say that was fantastic. Um, you know, I guess one of my concerns is that the vast majority of our people that still go into primary care, they go not into underserved areas, they go into, you know, <laughs> regular or like middle class, upper class socioeconomic practices. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of our concerns too, is how do we try to get people to devote some of their time more to the underserved practices? Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you thought, you know, when we had a practice at Beth Israel for three years that was actually in a faculty practice, 50% of our people went into primary care, but again, they went into similar type practices. I wonder if you can make any comments about that. Yeah, I totally agree, John. It's part of me, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of factors why people choose to do that. And I think part of what can drive residents, and this is obviously part of my talk, is feeling confident, feeling comfortable. We are much more likely to go somewhere when we feel comfortable. For too long, residency programs have not only focused on the inpatient setting, um, but in the primary care setting, either residents are in clinics that don't function well, um, they are in clinics, they only get exposed to one type of clinic. And so I think we end up doing a disservice to those who, who potentially would be really great in an underserved area. So my focus is trying to get residents comfortable with it. And I always equate this to like BiPAP. Residents know when a patient needs BiPAP. They know all the indications. They know how to start it. But when someone comes into the clinic and they hurt their ankle, it's like blank faces. Um, and I attribute that to the lack of exposure, time, and comfort. And so in the same vein, I would say it's not easy to take care of patients who have high social needs, but there are things we can do to, to help lessen that frustration and make the visit more rewarding. And so that's sort of where I think we need to be heading 
not just with the primary care residents, but obviously with our, our entire categorical program. Right. You know, I'll make one more comment and I'll let other people talk, but I'll just comment that in our last exit interview for our residents, two of our residents made a comment that they felt that the program was trying to change its focus and not send people into specialty care. Uh, I'm not really sure why that perception is there since more than 70% of our residents still pursue uh, subspecialty care. But I thought that was interesting that that kind of perception, negative perception against going into general medicine is still very strong out there. It absolutely is. Well, I'm thinking of the makeup of our own program leadership team, right? Right. The vast majority of us are, are primary care hospitalists, right? So it's, it's um, but I, I agree. I, I agree with you. Uh, Tamara, this is Fernando. Thank you very much for the awesome presentation. Um, uh, I, I have the pleasure and the honor to work uh, very closely in clinic, you know, with your graduates, you know, the, the, the first pictures that you show and the last pictures that you show. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a testament of, of the caliber of the education that you have been provided. I mean, these people are just amazing practitioners. Uh, in one of uh, the, the slides, just of one of the, the, the few slides at the end, you, there was a, in the graphic, you, you mentioned uh, threats. And, and in the threats is sort of the time dedicated to that. And um, when we think about social determinants of health, um, it's, it's a, it really requires time. I mean, like part of, of, of the understanding of, of these items uh, that are very complex is time. So my question to you, <clears throat> do we have in the literature um, anything that points out what will be the, the number, uh, the magic number of continuity clinic sessions that is optimal uh, in order to tackle social determinants of health in a comprehensive way? That's a, that's a great question. The answer is I have never come across that. What I have seen um, based on more, again, more survey data from IM program directors is that there isn't a threshold at which, not for underserved areas, but for interest in primary care, the number of continuity clinics, having more of them does not seem to translate into greater interest in primary care. And I think that is just to comment about exposure in and of itself is not enough. In the same way, exposure in an underserved area is not enough if it's not accompanied by mentorship, by faculty who are trained um, and who understand how to, to facilitate care for patients who are underserved. It's, it's just, um, it's a waste of resources. And I think we have a very underutilized resource here, which is Ryan, Ryan Health. Um, and I think we need to think about ways to more strategically, maybe not more time, but more strategically utilize the centers um, to, to benefit our residents in terms of their own preparedness. Thank you. Dr. Moharan from the chat, she mm -hmm. says that on occasion we have a, a you know, critical care fellowship applicants who are in primary care track in residency. Do you have any insights into the shift? And thank you for the outstanding talk. I always say, so when residents come to me and they're like, I, I don't know, I really like critical care and I really like primary care and I know that's so weird. I always say the opposite. I said, I don't think it's that weird. I think in some ways they're very similar. You're looking holistically at a patient. Um, and so I, I, it'd be really interesting to see the numbers, how many do that. Um, and make a transition, um, but I, I don't think they're totally dissimilar. I think obviously there are parts that are completely different, um, but I'm not sure what to make of that. And I will say sort of tagging to that is some primary care programs now are not focused on just generating primary care residents. They're uh, uh, physicians. They're actually will take people who are interested in endocrinology um, and some of the more primary care focused specialties um, so the goals are shifting as well. Um, and I, I, again, I don't know how to comment specifically about critical care, but it is an interesting observation, which I've noticed as well. Tamara, uh, yes. Doreen, uh, fantastic uh, talk, by the way. I guess I, my question is that uh, we as providers are looking at the downstream effect of the, our, system in terms of the the country the 
the social determinant of care and the poverty has to do with the lack of patients getting um, perhaps the right wages and access to what they need. And so, um, although I, I agree that we should spend time with the downstream, if we don't deal with the upstream component, we are always gonna have an underserved society, right? And so how do we as physicians um, through our different um, bodies like impact such that patients deserve to have help come in and we don't have to spend so much time working on something that they are entitled to as human beings to start with? Great question. So I think what we're gonna start to see is a shift and you can already see it in the med ed literature on advocacy. And I think we associate advocacy with somehow, you know, any advocacy that involves the government. That's very different than thinking about, for example, at Ryan, talking to the external affairs folks at Ryan. What are the big issues impacting the communities? How can the residents be involved in that? And sometimes it is advocacy. It's saying we need affordable housing. It's writing letters. Um, it doesn't have to be directly involving the government. It's getting involved with community-based organizations and ensuring that residents have exposure to community-based organizations to advocate for their patients. I, I didn't put this slide here, but in the article I referenced on structural competency, there's a beautiful chart that goes through the different, different levels of intervention that residents, physicians can impact, or physicians can impact from the clinic, from the individual self, my own biases, to the clinic setting, which is traditionally QI, um, to research, to community-based settings. And so it's worth, it's worth looking at, and that, that's prompting me to actually share that with everyone as well with the slides. But thank you, Doreen, your comment is well appreciated, and it's time to start looking upstream and actually acting upstream. All right, I'd also say people should realize that there are new models for primary care too. So there's a critical care doctor at Lenox Hill that actually does an outpatient practice and all of his patients are long-term ICU patients that have really special needs. And when he was at St. Vincent's, I used to cover for his practice. So he had people that had like pegs for, or had um, you know esophagectomies and stuff. And so you can really carve out a special niche for yourself if that's where you're interested. And so I'm specifically thinking of Kuhn who left and went into critical mm -hmm. care, right? But people mm -hmm. should think about these new models, especially in light of COVID where we know we're gonna have a lot of people with long-term complications. That's right. Thank you. Tamara, this is, this is Samuel. Um, kudos, a very nice talk. And really, you know, we're so proud of the work that you've done. And, and as Fernando said, so proud of our graduates. And it's been such a delight for us to have um, them populate our faculty and, and really uh, breathe such wonderful life into the work we're trying to accomplish. Thank you for the cognitive pauses. I, for one, really like them. Uh, my question is, what's your comfort level with telling a trainee or telling someone like me who works in primary care, it's okay to spend the whole visit on social determinants and have that be the substance of the visit for someone that I have continuity with. And, and also, you know, to, to drill down a little bit on that and to kind of put you on the spot, can I do that and still responsibly bill for that care? And do you see down the road vendors, insurance vendors, actually holding us accountable for addressing social determinants? So, yeah, so that's a loaded question. And I would say to answer the latter, um, as we move to a value-based system, I think it is going to be expected that we do that. We know, and I encourage the residents all the time, if someone, and I'm gonna use an example in a minute, but if you don't address the social determinants, we are ultimately doing damage to that patient. And a classic example is like somebody with asthma who's not controlled, we escalate their medications, we keep escalating them, making them prone to side effects, when in fact, we never ask them about their living environment. Oh yeah, by the way, I live in the public housing building and I have persistent leaks. Um, and so I think ultimately it's more time spent on that patient if we don't address the social determinants. So I encourage residents um, to focus if there's been an exacerbation in the patient's care or you've noticed a consistent pattern, 
we, we are obliged to try to address it or it's going to cost us more down the line. One example is a couple of weeks ago in clinic, um, one of the PGY2s had a patient, and I've used this example a couple of times over the last few weeks, a 30-year-old woman who had gestational diabetes who was coming in as a new visit. And she was reporting some fatigue and weakness. We decided to do a rapid A1C. Her A1C was 12. Uh, and we, while she was getting the A1C, we were discussing various management strategies and a patient who's breastfeeding and we need to give anti-glycemic agents, what should we use? I asked the residents to go back in the room and take a more detailed history once we found this out. She went in the room and surprised the patient's undocumented. She has six kids at home. She hadn't been eating because of severe food insecurity. And so this completely transformed our visit from insulin management to she needs emergency food. Um, there's no way she's going to take insulin if she doesn't have food. And so I think that's just to emphasize the example or the damage if we don't address it and if we're not even skilled at asking what's going to happen down the line. To answer, and, and I don't have clear answers on the billing component. Um, I don't know if someone else on the call would like to answer that. Um, but I do think, again, the, the cost ultimately will be greater if we fail to ask the questions. Uh, the, the, uh, Tamara, Fernando, again, I mean, they are codes. These are uh, Z codes. So and they, code, right. The R codes are there. What we know, though, is that they are completely underutilized and not all the payers will sort of like pay for the services, but there are codes, there are ICD-10 uh, codes uh, for yeah. these items. And that's one of, thank you, and that's one of the factors we stress with the residents to make it practical. You know, you can't just talk conceptually about social determinants, what can you actually do, is document Z codes. It's also helpful for the practice to understand what are the main barriers for our patients as a whole. Um, so document, document, document. Well, Dr. Goldberg, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. And, and again, um, thank you for all the wonderful work you're doing in the community and with our trainees. And it was a delight to hear from you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.